The Grand Canyon in Arizona is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. You could even fit the whole of Manhattan in there. It's so massive, it kind of has its own weather. But the Grand Canyon isn't the only big crack out there. The Valles Marineris is bigger, way bigger. It's on Mars, and it goes nearly a quarter of the way round the planet. It's 10 times as long as the Grand Canyon, and it's so deep, you could parachute into it. The Kesai Valles is also on Mars. It's made up of a series of canyons, and it might be the ancient home of a massive Mars flood. There are huge canals and canyons all over the Red Planet. There's Tiu Valles. That's where researchers think there was an epic battle between ancient Martian water and boiling hot volcanic lava. Guess we know who won that one. Equally impressive is Ares Valles. It's the longest known drainage system around. It might be weird to think of Mars as having huge waterways, rivers, and floodplains, but in its early days, Mars might have had a warm and wet climate. Now it's just dried up canyons as far as the eye can see. The Ithaca Chasma looks like a giant scar on Saturn's moon Tethys. It's four times longer than the Grand Canyon and about three times as deep. And it's billions of years old. No one's been kayaking there yet. We've only seen a photo of it, thanks to the spacecraft Voyager 1. Mercury's Great Valley makes the Grand Canyon look like a tiny pothole. NASA's Messenger spacecraft was the first to snap some photos of this massive formation. The valley's surrounded by two giant somethings, the Enterprise and Belgica, whatever that means. Pluto's largest moon, Charon, has a canyon named Argo Chasma, and it's huge. Even though Pluto's not called a planet anymore, it can still brag about its huge canyon. Even right here on Earth, the Grand Canyon has some serious rivals. Yarlung Tsangpo Canyon is the deepest canyon on Earth. It's in the Himalayas, in Tibet. Some people call it the Everest of Canyons. You could fit a 2,000-story building in it. The Indus River Gorge is big and gnarly. It's in Pakistan, and you could stack three football fields inside it. The Indus River, one of the largest rivers in Asia, passes through it, and it's even home to baleen whales and porpoises. The Colca Canyon in Peru is a short but insanely bumpy bus ride away from Machu Picchu. It's the massive home for the largest flying bird in the world, the Andean condor. It has a wingspan of 10 feet. In Nepal, where the Himalayas are, is the spectacular Kali Gandaki Gorge. No one knows exactly how far down it goes, but it's probably around five times as deep as the Grand Canyon. It's got it all, crazy terrain, thin air, and it's in the middle of nowhere. So beware, only experienced hikers should dare go in. The Copper Canyon in Northern Mexico is home to a world-famous group of people who run marathons, or even double marathons, just for fun. There are six canyons all joined together, and in its widest part are two of Mexico's tallest waterfalls. Copper Canyon also has one of the longest zip lines in the world, and one of the scariest train rides you'll ever take. Don't look down. Even in the US, there's a lesser known canyon that's deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's Hell's Canyon. And it's sort of on the border between Oregon and Idaho. It was carved out by the Snake River. Hell's Canyon is home to the Seven Devils mountain range. The King's Canyon is in the Yosemite National Park area. It's about one and a half times as deep as the Grand Canyon. Nearby is the second largest tree on Earth, General Grant. The largest canyon in Australia is the Caperty Canyon, and you can get paid to go there. Eh, sort of. A few lucky cyclists and campers over the years have found gemstones on the banks of the Caperty River. If you're lucky, you'll also see some 2,000-year-old rock art. The Tiger Leaping Gorge is right out of a fairy tale, but it's very real, very deep, and pretty scary. 
the legend says that a tiger was being chased, and it leapt over the river at the bottom of the gorge, with a little help from a perfectly placed rock right in the middle of the river. The Great Rift Valley is 15 times longer than the Grand Canyon. So what, that's like a trillion miles long? It goes through two continents and is home to about 30 lakes. It's even visible from outer space. So if you're ever floating out there in the cosmos, keep an eye out for it. The Kota Hawasi Canyon is deep, very deep. It has extreme rafting, kayaking, and hiking. And apparently the mosquitoes are pretty extreme too. There's one canyon in Tibet that I'm pretty sure holds a world record. Try looking up the Polong Tsangpo Canyon. No images pop up. It's 2021, that's insane! What's down there? Yeah, probably just a river and stuff. Columbia's Chickamauga Canyon is pretty much as deep as the Grand Canyon. Extreme sports own this place! Zip lining, canoeing, paragliding. Heck, even their cable car is extreme. It's a 25 minute ride, and it's steep. Under Greenland is the Greenland Grand Canyon, and it goes for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Water from melting icebergs runs through the canyon. It was actually NASA who discovered it. There's an absolutely massive canyon in Antarctica. The only problem, you can't see it. But apparently, it's freezing cold and mostly white. The sea has some mighty canyons too. The Zemchuk Canyon is one of the biggest underwater canyons. It's right off the coast of Alaska and it's home to seals, dolphins, and whales. The deepest underwater canyon is about six times as deep as the Grand Canyon. It's the famous Mariana Trench. Make it to the bottom and you'll break the world record for deepest dive ever. The Grand Bahama Canyon is another underwater marvel. You could just keep dropping Empire State Buildings in there and you'd never see them on the surface. Monterey Bay is pretty laid back but its canyon is anything but. There's lanternfish, squid, sea turtles, rockfish, and sea otters all hanging out together. Oh, and thousands of jellyfish, so take care not to get stung too much. There's also giant kelp around there, a seaweed that can grow up to 100 feet long. The Hudson Canyon runs from the New York Harbor right into the sea, and it's gross. Sure, it has deep sea coral and sponge formations, but it also has a whole bunch of trash and sewagey sludge coating the bottom. The Aviles Canyon is off the coast of Spain. It's one of the deepest underwater canyons in the world, and it's one of the few places where giant squid live. It's famous for its white coral and the fact that it's insanely cold. Bremer Canyon in Australia is underwater, massive, and dangerous, especially if you're a giant squid. That's the favorite snack of the local orca, the huge whale with a monster appetite. Bremer Canyon's a major tourist destination these days, especially for those looking to snap a pic of the more than 100 orcas that call it home. The Nazare Canyon is near Portugal. It's the largest submarine canyon in Europe and it's around three miles deep. That's six of the world's tallest buildings. It forms high breaking waves, so it's become a haven for big wave surfers. The Canadian Arctic Rift System is huge. It goes all the way from the Labrador Sea to the Arctic Archipelago, and it connects the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans. So picture this, Greenland used to be smashed up against Canada some millions of years ago. Thanks to this rift system, Greenland's been slowly drifting away. Think how huge Canada would be if you added Greenland onto it. A recent study claims that the moon has a tail, and every month it wraps around our planet like a scarf. A slender tail made up of millions of atoms of sodium follows Earth's natural satellite, and our planet regularly travels directly through it. Meteor strikes blast these sodium atoms out of the moon's surface and further into space. For several days every month, the moon remains between the sun and our planet. That's when Earth's gravity picks up that sodium tail. Our planet drags it into a long stripe that wraps around its atmosphere. This lunar tail is totally harmless, 
It's also invisible to the human eye, 50 times dimmer than what you can perceive. But during those rare days, high-powered telescopes can spot its faint yellowish glow in the sky. The tail looks like a gleaming spot that's five times the full moon's diameter. Mathematicians claim white holes might exist. Unfortunately, scientists haven't found one yet. Even if you saw a white hole, you wouldn't be able to enter it from the outside. But you'd notice light and matter leaving it. Betelgeuse, a red giant in the Orion constellation, started to dim in 2019. This confused astronomers. By that time, the star had already swollen to enormous proportions. If it was to replace our sun, its outer surface would spread far beyond Jupiter's orbit. And then Betelgeuse became dimmer in the fall of 2019. This process continued through February 2020. The changes could already be seen with the unaided eye. No wonder the star's brightness had dipped by two-thirds. At that time, astronomers were sure Betelgeuse was about to explode into a supernova. They continued to observe the star, but unexpectedly, it returned to its regular brightness in April. Thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, scientists figured out that the star had ejected some of its material, and this partially blocked its light. Our Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy, our closest neighbor, are going to meet. But it'll happen in about 4 billion years. When they collide, an enormous elliptical galaxy will be formed. There might be more water on the moon than scientists thought before. And not only on its dark side, but also its sunlit side. This water is likely to come in handy during the already planned missions in the future. Cotton candy exoplanets are particular planets outside of our solar system. Also called super puffs, they have the lowest density ever discovered. This gives them an airy, fluffy appearance. But despite looking like the most popular amusement park treat, these planets are enormous. The Juno mission has noticed something weird in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. The unusual phenomenon was blue sprites and elves twirling above the planet. These are two kinds of bright flashes of light that appear for short periods of time, mere milliseconds. They extend up and down toward the surface of the planet. On Earth, such flashes usually happen at a height of 60 miles above massive thunderstorms. In the universe, there are not only dwarf planets, but also dwarf galaxies. They have from 1,000 to a few billion stars. For comparison, the Milky Way galaxy is made up of 250 to 400 billion stars. A storm the size of our planet keeps raging on Saturn. It's called the Great White Spot. The storm has a tail of white clouds, and it encircles the entire planet. The storm occurs every 30 years or so, when Saturn's northern hemisphere tilts toward the sun. At first, the storm is indeed just a spot, and then it starts stretching in length. That's because the Great White Spot is a huge system of thunderstorms. But the main mystery puzzling astronomers is where the storm gets its energy from. Some scientists think it might be powered by the sun. Others disagree. And they say the storm's cloud pattern only makes sense if there's an internal heat source that can power the winds. Rogue planets don't orbit their stars, maybe because they don't have any. These free-floating space bodies travel across the universe and can end up literally anywhere. They're also very hard to find. Rogue planets don't produce light, neither do they emit heat, which means they can't be seen in infrared light. But not so long ago, Astronomers spotted the smallest rogue planet in the Milky Way. It's smaller than Earth, but a bit bigger than Mars. The moon seems to be shrinking. Earth's natural satellite is now 150 feet smaller than it used to be hundreds of millions of years ago. The reason for this phenomenon might be the cooling of the moon's insides. It could also explain the quakes shaking the surface of our planet's natural satellite. Astronomers have recently found out that Mars is seismically active. Mars quakes occur there on a regular basis. Scientists often discover strange things in space. Many of them look like blurry blobs. But there's one type of these blobs that doesn't look like any other known space body. The odd radio circles are only visible in radio telescopes. They aren't the remains of supernovae or a bizarre optical effect. Some astronomers go as far as to claim that they might be the throats of wormholes. Those are hypothetical tunnels between black holes. Fast radio bursts are blindingly bright bursts of radio waves. They pack as much energy as our sun produces in days, but last for mere milliseconds. 
Most of these fast radio bursts came from far, far beyond the Milky Way. But recently, astronomers have detected some originating in our home galaxy, and their source was a magnetar, just 30,000 light years away from our planet. Any liquid floating in outer space forms itself into a sphere. This phenomenon also occurs in low Earth orbit. Not so long ago, scientists discovered that one of the most massive stars in the neighborhood just disappeared. It was a star 75 million light years away from Earth. Normally, it'd be too far away for astronomers to clearly see individual stars, but only unless they're huge. And the star we're talking about was enormous. It was shining 2.5 million times brighter than the sun. Astronomers saw the star for the last time in 2011. They decided to examine it more closely several years later, but it was already too late. The star had vanished. Such massive stars usually go out in an extremely bright supernova, but astronomers noticed nothing like that in this case. There's a theory that the star collapsed into a black hole without triggering a supernova first. It does occur among stars approaching the end of their lives, but very, very rarely. In billions of years, the universe is likely to expand so much that we won't be able to see any stars in the sky. All planets in the solar system emit radio waves. They're especially strong if we talk about Jupiter. This planet has the biggest and most powerful magnetic field. But astronomers couldn't detect any radio waves coming from a planet outside the solar system. That is, until 2020. The signal scientists recorded came from a gas giant, Tau Bootes. It's 51 light years away from our planet. Thanks to this signal, astronomers managed to find out a bit about the planet's magnetic field. And in the future, this will help to learn more about what's happening in the planet's atmosphere. Dwarf planet Haumea is further from Earth than Neptune. It's orbiting in the Kuiper Belt. That's a donut-shaped ring of ice objects circling the Sun. Elongated Haumea has two moons. A day on this dwarf planet lasts four Earth hours. All in all, this space body is rather bizarre. It's surrounded by thin rings that likely appeared as the result of an ancient collision. A star in the galaxy GSN 069 is likely to turn into a planet the size of Jupiter in the next trillion years. It might happen because of the star's regular encounters with a black hole. First, astronomers noticed unusual X-ray bursts that were strangely bright. They went off every nine hours. After studying this phenomenon for some time, the scientists realized it was a star moving in a unique orbit around a black hole. The dazzling flashes? It was the material getting slurped off the star's surface by the black hole. It turned out that over millions of years, the black hole had already transformed the red giant into a white dwarf. And the process isn't going to stop whatsoever. Astronomers have found some traces of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. On our planet, this gas, colorless and flammable, is often found where microbes live. No wonder a new theory suggests there might be life on Venus. But even if there was some life on the evening star, it could have only appeared in its atmosphere. Probably no living organism would be able to survive the planet's extreme environment. Venus's surface is extremely dry. There's no liquid water on the planet, and the pressure there is 90 times greater than that on Earth's surface. The temperatures often rise higher than 900 degrees Fahrenheit, that's hot enough to melt some metals. Hey, wake up! Quick, listen to that. It's a five-second FM signal coming from one of Jupiter's moons. You fumble for your phone and inform your colleagues. They freak out over the news and rush to the lab. You've been a scientist working with the Juno probe, exploring Jupiter for years. But this is the first time you've witnessed something so unusual. Ganymede is Jupiter's largest moon and the biggest moon in our solar system. If this space body didn't orbit around Jupiter, it would be classified as a planet. It's even bigger than Mercury and Pluto. What makes this moon stand out among others is the fact that it has its own magnetic field. The moon was born around 4.5 billion years ago. It means it's as old as Jupiter itself. This planet-sized space body takes 7 Earth days to orbit its planet. Everyone gathers at the laboratory, impatiently waiting for you to play the recording of the signal coming from space. Your colleagues get their game on, trying to figure out what the source of this mysterious sound is. Around 40% of Ganymede's surface is dark, with craters scattered around. And 60% is light-colored. There are formations that were probably caused by tectonic activity or the release of water from under the surface. 
Scientists managed to discover a thin layer of oxygen trapped in the moon's atmosphere. The temperatures there are super low, between minus 170 to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. There isn't much information about how the moon behaves or what chemical elements it hides inside. Some of your colleagues try to create the same conditions that existed when the sound was transmitted. For hours, they sit there waiting, but nothing. Maybe it was a fluke. You get to the control system and activate the Juno spacecraft. The main point of this mission is to observe Jupiter's gravity, magnetic fields, the atmosphere, and the planet's evolution. By the way, there's also some evidence that Jupiter's largest moon is evolving too. Since it has a magnetic field surrounding it, auroras pop up all the time. Those are glowing gas circling the moon's north and south poles. If life existed in such a place, it would probably be at the bottom of Ganymede's extremely salty ocean. For a long time, scientists thought that the sun was a crucial component to kickstart life. But now we know that there are organisms dwelling deep at the bottom of the oceans. Those are doing just fine without sunlight. The oceans of our planet are teeming with some of the most bizarre creatures of all shapes and sizes. Sea lilies live some 10,000 feet underwater. They got their name because they look like flowers. Except they're not plants, but animals. Don't be fooled by their stems and leaves. Those are body parts equipped with nerve endings to detect food around them. Goblin sharks are probably some of the most weird-looking sharks that live at the bottom of the ocean. They can grow up to 12 feet long and have a very unusual snout. Now, take a look at the anglerfish. It has a bioluminescent blob on its head to attract prey and navigate its way around the dark ocean floor. It's a natural flashlight that never needs new batteries. It's only the females that have these flashlights, though. The blobfish is another bizarre animal living down there. It lives in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, 9,000 feet under the surface. Anyway, even though you asked everyone to keep the news confidential, it somehow leaks to the media and becomes a new trending topic. You get a call from a news agency. They say they want to interview you about this breakthrough that may prove life exists in outer space. The next day, you head down to the news station to talk about your discovery. You have a whole live studio audience watching your every move as you reach out to grab your glass of water. The crew scurries around doing some last-minute checkups before you're live on air. The makeup artist does some final brush-ups. The sound engineer asks you to test your mic once more. Several of the producers are sitting in the front seats. Bright lights are flooding the studio. The countdown begins. 3, 2, 1, and… You're introduced, and the host asks you to explain what it was that you heard. You tell them about the Juno space probe orbiting Jupiter. After a couple of questions, the host finally brings up the most dreaded one. Might the mysterious sound be coming from another civilization? Everyone leans in, waiting for you to answer. You freeze, not knowing what to say. Even though the crushing pressure at the bottom of the ocean is a thousand times stronger than at sea level, life still exists there. Algae, which is considered a delicacy in the ocean world, is off-menu for deep-sea creatures due to a lack of sunlight. Many of these bottom dwellers have to munch on leftovers instead. Those sink down there from the upper layers of the ocean. The freezing temperatures and the intense pressure have altered the cells of these creatures. This has made them more resilient than the average fish. Bacteria were developing their own ways of surviving. Studies show that they feed on certain gases and chemicals, like sulfur and carbon dioxide. Methane and hydrogen are released when tectonic plates move against each other. And some of these bacteria feast upon those gases, too. Tardigrades, also known as water bears, are microscopic critters that can live and thrive in extreme conditions. You can find them in volcanoes, frozen glaciers, and even in the empty void of space. Which means that some life forms might actually exist on Ganymede. You explain this to your audience. Then you mention that you don't have enough information to determine if it was another civilization or a natural phenomenon that produced the sound. This doesn't mean that the bottom of Ganymede's freezing oceans isn't teeming with its own bizarre and weird creatures. There might be some legendary beasts like the kraken or leviathan there. Or weird glowing fish with two heads. A fish with tentacles and a large fin. Giant crabs. The bacteria there might be as varied as our own. 
The plants, if they exist there, have to be strong enough to survive the sub-zero temperatures. The animals on Jupiter's largest moon could be as big as our blue whales or as tiny as plankton. After the interview, you head back to the lab to examine the records once more. On your way home, you see posters of yourself with captions like, Are we not alone? Hey, you've become a celebrity! Many people take pictures of you. You've been booked by other agencies for more interviews. Some science magazines even want to put you on the front cover as the person of the year. Every time you come to work, you wait for the sound to appear again. But nothing. You send a signal from the Juno probe, trying to make some sort of contact with whatever produced the sound. Nothing. That night, you pass out on your desk once more. Eureka moment wakes you up in the middle of the night. There might be something you've missed. You run the numbers again and realize that the answer was in front of you this whole time. It wasn't another civilization that produced this sound. The source was electrons. Every planet produces its own sound. It's created when charged particles from the solar wind and the planet's magnetosphere interact with one another. That's what happened on Ganymede. The electrons in its magnetic field, where the probe picked up the signal, were acting stranger than usual and this amplified some irregular frequencies. You're embarrassed and spend the rest of your night making phone calls, telling your team the news. The agency that interviewed you releases a statement. They explain that other civilizations aren't trying to contact us. You sit back at your desk, waiting for the next big thing to happen. Europa is another of Jupiter's moons that may host life. It's made up of an iron core, a mantle, and a salty ocean twice the volume of all the oceans on Earth. And just like Ganymede, the ocean lies under a water ice crust. Scientists claim that there might even be active volcanoes there, and some resilient bacteria may live there. With enough water, certain chemicals, and a source of energy, Europa could produce life. But it's unlikely that we'll find anything but tiny microbes. The moon's surface has millions of craters. But something else has drawn a lot of attention to it. A giant rare hole that turned out to be a tube. It was found when the Japanese Lunar Orbiter was gathering data around the moon's skylight, the tube's entrance. Researchers found a specific echo pattern that suggested there was a hollow area. They discovered more echo patterns at a couple of places near the hole, so there could be more lunar tubes there. But in this big tube, you could place an entire football field and the pit could swallow it whole. It's irregularly shaped and 427 feet in diameter. Scientists think that there could be secret caves, a tunnel system, or an entire geological wonderland under the surface. It could be a good shelter for astronauts that land on the moon, or even be a harbor for a lunar colony. No one ever managed to stay on the moon for more than three days because of the conditions on the satellite. It has a wide range of temperatures, low atmosphere, and no magnetic field that would protect life on the surface from things like radiation or harsh sun rays. Astronauts wear spacesuits, but they can't protect them over long periods of time. But a lava tube could. When a lava flow cools, it gets a hard crust which later thickens and creates a roof over that same lava. It continues to flow, but when it stops, the channel can drain, which results in an empty tube. Our planet also has lava tubes, but they're not as big as the one found on the moon. There's a special type of tree called a moon tree. It's grown from seeds that were taken into space during one of the missions and then returned back to Earth. You can find this kind of tree growing across the U.S. Earth is 27% bigger than the moon and far more massive. Our gravity is stronger. If you drop a rock on the Earth, it will fall faster. 150 pounds on Earth is just 25 pounds on the moon. The Earth has numerous satellites circling around it, but the Moon is the only natural one. Our Moon was formed during a big collision of the Earth and one more planet the size of Mars. This happened around 4.6 billion years ago, shortly after the Sun and our solar system were formed. After the collision, a cloud of vaporized rock went into orbit around our planet, cooled, and shaped into a ring of small solid bodies. They later got together and became the Moon leaving craters as a reminder of this collision. If you're standing on the surface of the moon, your shadow will be darker than on Earth. This is because there's no atmosphere to scatter light and create lighter shadows. 
One of Jupiter's moons, Io, has hundreds of volcanoes and pretty wild eruptions, sometimes sending plumes 250 miles into the atmosphere. These eruptions happen because of the extremely strong gravity this moon is exposed to. Its insides tense up and relax in those periods when it gets closer to and then further from Jupiter, which generates enough energy for insane volcanic activity. It's not just planets, even quite small space bodies sometimes have moons. In 1993, researchers discovered a 20-mile-wide asteroid and its one-mile-wide moon. You'd need 400,000 moons to match the brightness of our central star, the Sun. The moon reflects the light it gets from the Sun, but it doesn't produce its own. That brightness depends on the angle between the moon, the Earth, and the Sun. Our moon is around 32 Earths away from us, and 29 Earths at its closest. When the night is dark and clear, it seems like you can touch a full moon. But if you wanted to do it, you'd have to travel up to 250,000 miles. Still, there is water on the moon. Not puddles or lakes, but grains of water ice exist in permanently shadowed parts near the moon's poles. Scientists think that water got on the moon a long time ago, during a period when both the moon and Earth were constantly struck by asteroids and comets, which contained water ice. This process may have even helped us get our own lakes and oceans, not just the moon's icy water. Newer research says that the moon's interior already had water, and it went to the surface during volcanic activity. The same might have happened on our planet too. Out of 200 moons in our solar system, our moon is the fifth biggest one. Jupiter's moon Ganymede is the biggest one, almost 1.5 times bigger than ours. Apollo 11 was the mission where humankind first landed on the moon. It was a very important moment, broadcast all over the world. But it was almost interrupted by a huge windstorm that was going on in Australia back then. Parker Dish was placed there, which was something we used to get the broadcast signals from the moon. The moon is not a perfect circle. It's more in the shape of an egg, with the thicker end pointing toward us. This shape is derived from its rotation. A full moon can keep you awake. Studies showed that people experienced less deep sleep, and it took them longer to fall asleep during the full moon period. It wasn't about its brightness, but the lunar cycle that influences our internal body clock. Each year, the moon is moving away from Earth because of the interaction between the moon's gravitational force and our oceans. In one year, it moves around 1.5 inches away, which means that in around 600 million years, it will be 14,600 miles further from Earth than it is now. This number isn't accidental. That's the time when total solar eclipses will stop happening. Humankind hasn't set foot on the moon in a few decades, but footprints there are still fresh because there are no winds up there, so these tracks can stay there for millions of years. The moon has its own time zone called Lunar Standard Time. Time is different on the moon, so a year there is divided into 12 days, considering each is as long as our month. Days got named after astronauts who walked on the moon. The moon calendar starts the moment Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon in 1969. There are possible energy sources for living beings on one of Saturn's moons. It has an ocean under the surface, and it may feature some chemical reactions similar to those that help certain forms of life on our planet survive. The moon used to have active volcanoes, probably during the time of the dinosaurs. Molten lava hardened on its surface billions of years ago, which helped create unique lunar craters. But the volcanoes have been dormant for a long time now. The moon has earthquakes, or rather, moonquakes. Just like our planet, the moon also has a crust that goes through changes and shifts. Shaking occurs when its crust warms and expands, or it can even be caused by meteorite impacts. Moonquakes are not as strong as earthquakes, but can last way longer since the moon doesn't have enough water to prevent seismic vibrations. The moon has a big range of temperatures because it doesn't have an atmosphere. During the day, it can go up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, but at its poles, the temperature is around negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2019, astronauts discovered a strange space phenomenon. The moon was crossing in front of the sun, and at one moment, it seemed like it stopped and then started moving backward. It's the same optical illusion like when you're driving on the highway and pass a car that's slower than you. At one moment, as you move ahead, it may appear like it's going backward. 
The crust of the moon is not equally thick in all its parts. Some are up to 37 miles thick, while others are much thinner. The moon itself doesn't change colors. When sunlight goes through our atmosphere, it reflects off the moon and makes us see it as pink or red. Sometimes there are particles of dust sent into the atmosphere, and in combination with sunlight, they give the moon an orange glow. The moon doesn't have a dark side. There's only a far side that we can't see from the Earth. The moon spins on its axis once and makes a circle around the Earth all in the same amount of time, which is why we only see its one face the entire time. All planets in our solar system have at least one moon, except for Mercury and Venus. Mercury has less mass than our planet, so its gravity is lower than ours, around 38% of the Earth's gravity. That means 100 pounds on Earth would be 38 pounds on Mercury. Because of the weaker gravity, and since it's so close to the Sun, Mercury wouldn't be able to have its own moon. It would probably crash into Mercury, or even go into orbit around the Sun, and someday even get pulled into it. Venus most likely doesn't have its moon because it's also too close to the Sun. Jupiter's gravity shattered a huge comet. It wasn't enough for the space monster. A real catastrophe happened. The shards didn't fly in different directions. They lined up and rushed towards Jupiter like the rail cars of a train. 21 fragments up to one mile in diameter burst through Jupiter's atmosphere. Fireballs at the speed of 37 miles per second bombarded the planet's shell. They heated the space around them to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's higher than the temperature in the sun's upper atmosphere and 312 times hotter than you need to boil an egg. Well, I'm not hungry anymore. The impact was like from a rock falling into a pond. The meteorite fragments formed giant plumes on the surface of Jupiter. Substances from its lower atmosphere rushed upwards. The process generated a tremendous amount of energy. Overheated streams of fire shot into the stratosphere. The monsters left behind them glowing plumes 1,900 miles long. That's greater than the distance between New York and Texas. Dark bruises appeared at the side of the blows. They were about the size of the Earth. Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 was the name of the violator of Jupiter's boundaries. The collision of celestial bodies happened in July 1994. It was a scientific sensation. For the first time in human history, a catastrophe of this magnitude was observed. The attack raised an important question for astronomers. Why is Jupiter unlucky? Space monsters attack it thousands of times more often than the Earth or any other planet in the solar system. All right, let's see. You decide to board a starship and travel to the mysterious Jupiter. A space probe would need two years to get there, but your starship is faster. You'll be there in… Great, the journey only took a second. Jupiter is actually big. It could fit 1,300 Earth-sized planets in it. It looks beautiful thanks to gas clouds. This planet has no solid surface, but there's a strange stain on its surface. It looks like a huge eye that can fit three and a half Earths. This storm will scare anyone. It's 10 times higher than Everest, and the wind rushes at a speed of 300 miles per hour. It's been going on for 350 years. You wouldn't hide from such a storm in a car, so it's good you're in a starship. If all the planets of the solar system merged into one super planet, the new object would still be two and a half times smaller than Jupiter. Large size also affects gravity. Spacecraft use Jupiter as a springboard to jump. The giant's gravity increases their flight speed and helps them reach their target faster. Gravity has turned the planet into a magnet for comets, asteroids, and dangerous space debris. Jupiter is a true space superhero. Its gravity shield takes a hit and deflects space monsters that fly into the inner solar system. The dinosaurs don't agree, but more on that a little bit later. What if Jupiter was swallowed up by a giant vacuum cleaner tomorrow? I can only say one thing, we'd have huge problems. Without a giant shield, thousands of comets and asteroids are attacking the planet much more often. Most of them burn up in the atmosphere or aren't large enough to affect us. But there are also larger comets and asteroids. After their collision with the Earth, you can say goodbye to all life on the planet. For example, in 2009, a celestial body crashed into Jupiter. It left a bruise the size of the Pacific Ocean. It's scary to think what traces it would leave on our planet. Most likely, the Earth would turn into a fireball. But recent research from astronomers suggests that Jupiter isn't such a nice guy. On the contrary, it's a bad guy with a slingshot that shoots comets at the Earth. A physicist used computer simulations. 
he found that Jupiter is equally likely to deflect and send comets toward the Earth. The giant attracts potentially dangerous objects and only partially protects us. It's already tried to knock out our planet many times. 66 million years ago, a cosmic body 10 miles in size crashed into the Earth. The energy of the impact set the surface of the planet on fire. It caused a huge earthquake and tsunami. A fiery rain fell from the sky on the Earth. There were millions of tons of debris and dust in the atmosphere. They stopped the sun's rays from reaching the planet. The nuclear winter began. This disaster led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Scientists have named this space criminal Chicxulub Impactor. Computer simulations of scientists at Harvard University showed where it came from. Chicxulub wasn't an asteroid, but a comet. This means that the core of its body wasn't stone and metal, but ice, dust, and frozen gas. It resembled a dirty snowball flying through space. The meteorite wasn't going to set fire to the Earth, but Jupiter intervened in the plan. It threw comets in our direction. In 1770, Lexell's comet appeared near the Earth. Our planet and this object were separated by only 1.4 million miles, close to nothing in space terms. Lexell's comet came closer to Earth than any other comet in human history. The object could have stopped life on Earth. The comet flew too close to Jupiter. The giant caught it and sent it in our direction. Now, this isn't a very good move for a superhero that protects the solar system. After three years, the comet went past us. It flew two times around the sun and returned to Jupiter like a boomerang. This time, the giant pushed the comet out of the solar system. But let's not blame Jupiter. Scientists believe that without this gas giant, life on Earth would most likely never have happened. Jupiter sent meteorites toward Earth, which carried organic molecules and water with them. They were the building blocks from which earthly life began. Nobody knows if comets would come with a valuable cargo without Jupiter and its dangerous gravity. If you fly away from Earth to the center of the solar system, you'll see the Sun. Eight planets are flying around this star. There's a belt of more than one million asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. One theory says there was only the Sun at the very beginning of the solar system's existence. Clouds of stone and dust surrounded the star. These particles attracted each other and formed planets over millions of years. Jupiter didn't want any new neighbors. Its powerful gravity prevented rocks and dust from uniting into planets. They remained asteroids and gathered in a belt inside the solar system. If today all the asteroids merged into one planet, we'd get a cosmic body that would weigh only 4% of the mass of the Moon. Previously, the belt was densely populated, but Jupiter's gravity threw 99% of the asteroids to other places in space. Jupiter isn't the only one that plays a role in the development of life on Earth. Our main assistant is the Moon. It's the only natural satellite of the Earth. Jupiter has 79 satellites, and every year there are more and more of them. Jupiter is also surrounded by rings, but they aren't as beautiful as Saturn's and are practically invisible. The rings are composed of small black particles. This is the dust that the meteorites eject into space after colliding with the moons of Jupiter. The moon is responsible for the ebb and flow of the ocean. It regulates the life of bees, fish, birds, and amphibians. Even you feel the influence of the moon every day. Changing the brightness of the disk in the night sky regulates the level of melatonin in your brain. This hormone is responsible for circadian rhythms, which are important for healthy sleep. The moon came about thanks to another catastrophe, like many other things in space. Millions of years ago, the Earth looked like a ball of hot lava. There was no water or air. It was enveloped only in carbon dioxide and nitrogen. At this time, another planet the size of modern Mars crashed into the Earth. Scientists named it Theia. At a speed of 8,900 miles per hour, it collided with the Earth. The impact of incredible force threw millions of tons of material into space. The debris gathered into a ball that became known as the Moon. Scientists have almost solved the mystery of the Moon, but they don't know if there's a solid core in the middle of Jupiter or if it's dense hot soup that hangs in space. Jupiter has the largest ocean in the solar system. It's made of liquid hydrogen, not water. If Jupiter were 80 times more massive, it would turn into a bright star. Jupiter is a unique place that will never be home to humans. The pressure inside the planet is 2 million times greater than on the surface of the Earth. Extreme pressure and temperature would ruin any spacecraft that's gone too far. I guess that means Jupiter would have a crush on you. Imagine a still, frozen world. 
It's ancient, about 4.5 billion years old. It's barely heated by the rays of the sun and covered with a thick layer of ice. This world is smaller than our moon, but a bit larger than Pluto. Its name is Europa, the sixth satellite of Jupiter and one of the biggest moons in the solar system. But the coolest thing about this faraway place, it might host life. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking missions to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Interestingly, the new discovery about these shallow pools came about by sheer luck. The scientist leading the research, Riley Kohlberg, accidentally saw a presentation of his colleague, a planetary scientist. That scientist showed a picture of double ridges on the surface of Europa, and Kohlberg remembered that he had seen similar ridges on Earth. But while such formations are rare on our planet, they are way more numerous on Europa. The following studies suggested that the ridges on Jupiter's moon might be the result of a specific cycle, similar to that on Earth. In this cycle, liquid water freezes and then thaws inside an ice sheet, which is a rather high-pressure environment. This causes the sheet to move upward over and over again, creating a two-peaked structure. Or at least, that's what happens on Earth. If the processes on Europa are similar, it can prove the presence of shallow waters on the satellite. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are very different on Europa. And scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water pockets are, or how long they need to refreeze. But what is more or less clear is that such under-ice environments on Europa are very likely to be protected from Jupiter's harsh radiation battering the satellite's surface which, in turn, increases the chances of life existing on Europa. Now, can we get back to the fact that the ocean on Europa seems to be salty? Red streaks on the satellite's surface might have this color due to their chemical content. They're likely a frozen mixture of water and salts. This is quite unusual because such a composition doesn't match any known substance here on Earth. As for yellow spots on Europa's surface, those might be caused by the presence of sodium chloride, you know this substance as good old table salt. Scientists tried to recreate the conditions on Europa in a lab. They discovered that by combining water, table salt, freezing temperatures, and high pressure, they could get a new kind of solid crystal. This substance might exist both at the bottom of Europa's ocean and on the moon's surface. But besides this information, researchers are in the dark. Hopefully, we'll find the answers to some of these questions around 2030. That's when a mission called Europa Clipper, which is going to be launched by NASA, will probably reach Europa. The mission is going to have several close flybys and figure out if any form of life can exist on the moon. The European Space Agency's JUICE, which stands for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is going to visit Europa in the next couple of years too. But Europa isn't the only place in the solar system that might host or once hosted life. In 2003, Mars Express, a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency, discovered methane in the atmosphere of Mars. On our planet, the biggest part of this gas in the atmosphere is produced by living creatures, for example, by cattle digesting food. However, scientists think that methane was stable in the Martian atmosphere for about 300 years. And then, in 2006, the methane almost entirely vanished from the red planet and it happened 600 times faster than researchers' models accounted for. The question, what or who generated the gas? And where did it go? 
Another Martian mystery is microbes that may be sleeping beneath the surface of Mars. There, they might have been protected from the harsh radiation coming from space for millions of years. Scientists simulated the conditions on Mars in a lab to check if it could possibly be true. And they were amazed to find out that bacteria could easily survive in such conditions for 280 million years. Which means that if life existed on Mars, we could find the evidence in the planet's subsurface by drilling into the Martian soil. Right now, there is no flowing water on Mars, and cells or spores would simply dry out. Plus, the surface temperature is similar to that of dry ice. In other words, the surface of the planet is deeply frozen. And still, there could be six types of bacteria and fungi living underground on the red planet. The most likely of them is nicknamed Conan the Bacterium due to its tough nature. Well, I guess time will show. Now let's move to Venus. In 2020, scientists announced that in the toxic Venusian atmosphere, there was something that might mean the existence of life. Unfortunately, scientists didn't have any evidence since there was no chance to collect any microbe specimens or snap any pictures of extraterrestrial life. But they claimed that they had discovered a chemical called phosphine there, and it was a big deal. If it wasn't some previously unknown chemistry that was producing this gas, then there could be some kind of microbial life involved in the process. Phosphine is made up of three atoms of hydrogen and one atom of phosphorus. This gas is toxic to any terrestrial life form that needs oxygen, including us humans. On our planet, phosphine can be found in places with no or little oxygen, for example, marshes and swamps. The gas is created by complex mixtures of bacteria living there. It can also be produced industrially. Come to think of it, phosphine isn't supposed to be in Venus's atmosphere altogether. This gas needs precise pressure and temperature and tons of hydrogen to form. It wouldn't be all that surprising to find it on Saturn or Jupiter or famous gas giants. But on Venus, totally unexpected. There's no way phosphine can be naturally produced on this planet. Tiny amounts of it can be created during volcanic eruptions, lightning storms, minerals blown up to the surface, or meteorites entering Venus's atmosphere. But not as much as astronomers thought they had observed. And it had to make scientists suspicious. But they were too happy about their discovery. They probably thought it meant there could be life on Venus. But even if this gas was created by some mysterious organisms, it would be a big question how they survived on Venus. On our planet, some microbes can thrive in environments with an acidity of 5%, but no more. On Venus, though, clouds are almost entirely made of acid, containing more than 90% of sulfuric acid. The Venusian atmosphere is also 50 times as dry as the driest place on our home planet. And indeed, in 2022, thanks to better and more high-resolution telescopes, it was concluded that there was no phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. Or even if there was, it was a very small amount. So far, we need to look for signs of life further away from Earth. In space, no one can hear you scream. Or is that, in space, no one can hear ice cream? Well, either way, we know that no supernovas, crashing asteroids, and burning planets make a sound in space. Or do they? What if you actually can hear something out there? Well, let's see. Okie dokie, back to middle school. Ahem. Sound is a mechanical way of originating from vibration. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, the simplest example is guitar strings. Let's pluck one of them. It starts to vibrate. The atoms inside the metal string begin to push and beat the atoms of the air around them. So now, atoms are constantly pushing each other until they reach our ears. It's like a wave from a pebble thrown into a pond, and it happens very quickly, at a speed of about 761 miles per hour. Then our eardrums begin to vibrate at the same frequency, and the little bones inside our ears transmit this vibration to the brain. The brain then does its magic, recognizes the pattern, and turns it into sounds. Great! Now we know that we need some particles to create sound. And we can find these particles in gases, liquids, and solid substances. And what about space? Nope, it's almost a perfect vacuum. 
And you've probably already heard that there's no sound in space because it's a vacuum. But what does it actually mean? Well, a vacuum is a perfect void. It's an area completely devoid of matter. It means there's nothing there. Yeah. Despite all those celestial bodies in space, there's actually no air in between them. No atoms, no particles, nothing. Not a zippo. Well, almost. To be honest, the perfect vacuum doesn't really exist. We can't get rid of atoms for good. But space is very close to this notion. On average, there are 15 to 80 atoms per 1 cubic inch. This may sound like a big number, but keep in mind that these atoms are tiny, and the void distance between them is huge. For comparison, one cubic inch of air contains about 16,000 atoms. So of course, with such a low density, these atoms can't push each other. Even if the vibration is very strong, like, I don't know, a supernova, they still won't be able to do that. So, movies have been lying to us! All these epic space scenes actually take place in an awkward silence. Who would have guessed? But don't get upset. What if I tell you there are, in fact, some ways to hear sound in space? First of all, there's still sound on other planets. If there's an atmosphere on a space body, or at least something like gas, water, or a solid surface, there will be sound. In our case, the atmosphere becomes completely silent at about 60 miles above the Earth's surface. That's where the sky stops being blue and a black starry veil begins. In any case, we'd have to land on another planet, or at least get close to its atmosphere, to hear something. But whatever it is, it would sound very different. Let's take our favorite Venus as an example. The atmosphere there is very dense. Scientists jokingly call it a thick chemical soup. No thanks. So, if you somehow managed to stay alive and speak there, your voice would be very different. It would become much louder, and it would sound deeper. So, if you want a pleasant baritone, you know what to do. I wonder what would happen if Earth had a denser atmosphere. What would we hear then? Well, you can vaguely imagine that if you've ever been in the water. Water is very dense. Sound moves there much faster and better compared to the air, at a speed of almost a mile per second, depending on the water temperature. So if you sit in an empty room with no sound sources, you won't hear much, right? Now, dip your head in the water and check out how the same silence sounds here. It's not quiet at all. Even if you ignore the ever-present sounds of the water itself, you'll immediately notice how well you can hear your own body, how your blood pulsates in the veins, how your heart works, the slightest movement of your fingers. Kind of creepy, isn't it? This gives us an idea of what would happen to us on a planet with a denser atmosphere. And that's just crazy. We would hear everything. From scurrying animals to the movement of tectonic plates. Ah, come on, you'd probably say. It's obvious that there's sound on other planets. But didn't you say we can hear something in open space? Actually, yes. For example, in a cloud of dust. You can find space dust almost everywhere in space. It may be the remains of a star or something else. And in these places, everything is a bit denser than usual. This means there are probably dust clouds where particles are very close to each other, which means they can produce sounds. Of course, those will be very quiet and transmitted over a very short distance. But it's better than nothing, right? Plus, we already have one real space sound recorded. It came from the Perseus galaxy, which is located 250 million light-years away from us. NASA recorded it in 2003. Those of us music geeks will want to know that it's a B-flat, 57 octaves below middle C on the piano. You'd have to add another 660 keys to the left on the keyboard. But its frequency is so low that the human ear unfortunately can't hear it. But besides that, we can only hear something inside spaceships. These are small pockets of air, after all. In a spacesuit, you would hear sounds very well, too, including your breathing or blood circulation in a spacesuit. But two astronauts flying side by side wouldn't hear each other, even if they got very close and shouted very loudly. It's quite funny. If you, being an astronaut, bumped into something, it would be very loud for you, 
but your friend wouldn't hear anything. That's why astronauts use radio devices. Now, purely theoretically, if you could somehow crawl out of your spacesuit and survive, you'd be able to hear the chatter and noises going on inside the spaceship. But how? So look, we have some air inside the spaceship, and it transmits sound. It reaches the metal casing and gets through it. And then, if you leaned against the ship, preferably touching it with your elbow or knee, the sound would be transmitted to the brain directly through your bones, ignoring the ears. Yes, our bones conduct sound. That's how, for example, deaf people listen to music. It's called bone conduction. It's used in some headphones and some other technologies. You can do a little experiment. Hold your fingers over your ears. Shut them properly so that you really don't hear much. Then try to touch a sound source. It can be anything vibrating. For example, a speaker playing music with some part of your body where the bone is close to the skin. Now, watch the miracle happen. You can hear the sound not through your ears, but directly in your brain. But please, don't repeat this experiment in open space. You know, ice cream? (laughs) Now, you've probably heard about things like the sounds of space, where you can listen, for example, to the sounds made by the sun or different planets. How do we record these ones? Easily. There is another way to hear sound in space. Electromagnetic waves. In other words, a radio. Radio is the same form of electromagnetic radiation as light. These waves can travel in a vacuum without any problems. Astronauts' transmitters work that way. An astronaut says something to their friend. The sound waves turn into radio waves, reach the other person, and are then converted back into sounds. And this is how we get so-called space sounds. Our planet is actually very loud in that regard. We're sending a huge amount of radio waves into the universe, all radio signals we've ever listened to. It's a pity that they travel only 110 light years away from us. But you know, I think it's good that we don't hear everything that happens in space. Imagine if sound could easily travel through the universe? We would hear everything, from solar flares to nearby supernovas. Horrifying, right? So maybe we're just lucky. Hey, remember, in space, you can hear ice cream. Chocolate! Vanilla! The universe is not static. It evolves all the time and grows in all directions. It's expanding, and scientists found this out almost a century ago. And it's not at a stable rate. The more time goes by, the faster the universe expands. As this happens, stars, planets, and galaxies move farther and farther apart which leaves more space between them. If that's the case, the universe is supposed to become colder. After all, it was a lot denser when the Big Bang happened, and a lot hotter. As it was expanding, space was cooling down, which created conditions for planets, stars, and other space objects to form. Yeah, that's not exactly the case now. Scientists were surprised to hear it too. But our universe is actually getting hotter. They observe the temperature of cosmic gas farther away from our home planet compared to young gases closer to the Earth. Since we measure distance in space by light years, farther areas are like going back to the past, and regions closer to us are like observing the present day. They found out the temperature of a gas in space has gone up more than 10 times in the last 10 billion years. Now, the temperature of the cosmic gas that's spread all across the universe can get to around 4 million degrees Fahrenheit. Wow! As the universe expands, gravitational force does its part and pulls gas and dark matter together. It's doing some pretty hard work there. It creates galaxies and clusters of galaxies out of them. And this process is totally chaotic. It's so messy that more and more gas heats up as all of this is happening. Space was extremely hot when it was just forming 13.7 billion years ago. What if it gets warm like that once again? Scientists are observing the situation. They found out the temperature in space increased by measuring cosmic gases using something called redshift. They generally use this method when they want to see how far away some space objects are. Those that are closer to us have shorter light wavelengths. The farther some object is, the longer its light wavelengths are. And they can now determine the temperature of a certain object from its light. On average, 
Space is a pretty cold place. The glow that's left from the Big Bang is called the CMB, which is short for the Cosmic Microwave Background. It's so powerful and intense, it bathes the entire universe in light. It's the only thing that significantly heats up matter. But there are many smaller mechanisms that help to heat up matter in the universe. And they could go crazy if space warms up. Like stars, they emit radiation that affects nearby dust and gas. They radiate throughout the far infrared too. When a star is at its early stage, the radiation coming from it forms protoplanetary structures that look like disks. They primarily form in a single plane, and a bright central star produces spectacularly illuminated gas, and there are blue reflections of this gas. It was like that with our planetary system too. Strong energy and gravitational forces cause collisions, dust, and gas in an uncontrolled vortex that's forming planets. That's why most planets in our solar system orbit in the same direction. That's the direction this giant whirlpool was spinning a long time ago, too. Active stars, colliding galaxies, stellar cataclysms, black holes, neutron stars. The universe has so many sources of energy. And when you surround normal matter in space with such an energetic environment, it heats up drastically. When you heat something up, it radiates that energy away in a certain way. In most cases, galaxies have just a couple of areas where stars are forming, at regions where gas is collapsing. A bubble that surrounds that area contains ionized hydrogen. Three quarters of our sun is hydrogen. Thanks to that hydrogen, the sun keeps us warm. In its core, hydrogen transforms into helium and causes atomic fusion. Yep, that's how our sun releases its energy. Radiation heats all that gas to thousands and thousands of degrees. At the same time, it ionizes a large number of atoms and molecules, which basically means it turns them into ions. Atoms are neutral particles, and ions are either negatively or positively charged particles. If the universe heats up, our sun might too. If its temperature hits 30,000 degrees Kelvin, it could become hot enough to ionize all those materials it had previously ejected and it could create a real planetary nebula. This would be a nebula in the shape of a ring that forms because of an expanding gas that surrounds an aging star. As the temperature goes up all the time, hydrogen ionizes. At a few thousand degrees, this could turn the nebulae in our solar system pink with emission lines. Our sun could come to its end if it reaches the temperature of 50,000 degrees Kelvin. If you could float in space and come closer, you'd see it glow in eerie green tones because of doubly ionized oxygen. Higher energy phenomena make more galaxies collide. This heats gas even more and eventually results in X-ray emissions. What about black holes and radiating neutron stars? When they go crazy, they can shape whole galaxies and who knows what more. Maybe we'd have more masers too. Those are natural lasers our universe produces. They arise when big populations of molecules receive large amounts of energy. By now, scientists have found the strongest, yet the most distant, maser. So powerful, it's more luminous than the light 6,000 suns would produce, and in just one emission line. Maybe then we'd discover even stronger masers. That's in the case that we're even going to be here at all. Because as the universe is getting hotter, cosmic radiation is getting stronger not so good for life on Earth. Increased cosmic radiation could harm us. Who knows if life would even be possible on Earth in that case, or if the powerful gravitational force would pull our home planet too and crash it into another one. But maybe life as we know it wouldn't completely disappear. Or if that happened, it could possibly somehow find its way once again, maybe in the distant future. There's a possibility our universe could support life at its early stages, doesn't look like that when you think of the chaos the Big Bang caused, right? But that was only in its mere beginnings. After things had settled down a bit, the dregs of enormous, earliest stars formed rocky planets. In our solar system, those are Earth, Mars, Mercury, and Venus. You can't set your foot on the rest of them since they're gas giants. Back in that time, radiation was quite intense, so rocky planets had an adequate environment to form. 
since it takes a lot of energy to whirlpool dust and particles and bake a planet in the end. This period of time coincides roughly with that when the first stars formed in our universe. Ancient stars were way bigger than our sun. They lived shorter though. They would have just exploded as supernovas on their end, and they would leave heavy metals across the space around them. Those are the particles rocky planets form from. Radiation spread around the whole universe back then. It has changed over time. Today, it's almost an absolute zero. 400,000 years after the Big Bang, when hydrogen atoms were forming, CMB was almost as hot as the surface of our sun. And about 15 million years after the Big Bang, its temperature was close to room temperature, which is around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. These things were happening across the universe, so there were many planets that could potentially hold life. If we were one of those ancient worlds, we wouldn't need a star to keep us warm. CMB would be enough to do it. So, it's possible that life in space is way older than we think it is. There could have been ancient worlds with liquid water on their surface. What if there were some primitive forms of organisms, like on our home planet, a long time ago? Or even more developed ones? Perhaps we'll find out one day. It's normal for planets to be a bit tilted on the side. The Earth is tilted at a 23-degree angle. That's why we have seasons. It's summer when the part of the world where you are leans closer to the sun. It works the opposite way, too. It's winter when you lean away from it. But Uranus is tilted more than normal. It lies as a 98-degree angle, which has a huge effect on its seasons. Each season on Uranus takes 21 years to play out. Something to think about the next time we complain that winter lasts forever. Now, here on Earth, we measure distances in minutes and hours, maybe even days. It takes 10 minutes to walk to your best friend's house, or 15 minutes to drive to your favorite cafe. But in space, it's different. It's vast, which means we measure how long it takes to get to a certain point in years, or in most cases, light years. So, if you want to walk to the moon one day, that would take you 9 years to span the 239,000 miles. Perhaps you'd like to take a ride to the nearby star, Proxima Centauri. Maybe if you kept the pedal to the metal at a constant speed of 70 miles per hour, you'd get there in about 356 billion hours or around 40 and a half million years. Trust me, after the first 20 million years, you'd be second-guessing yourself as to why go there in the first place. Now, Mars contains the biggest valley, Valles Marineris, we've discovered so far. It's a pretty impressive system of canyons, 2,500 miles long. It's five times longer than the Grand Canyon. Researchers first spotted it back in the 1970s. A bank of volcanoes located on the other side of the canyon ridge probably helped form this valley. We haven't discovered a planet completely made of diamonds yet, but on some planets, it actually rains diamonds. On Jupiter and Saturn, gas giants of our solar system, lightning storms turn abundant methane into soot, which we also know as carbon. The soot falls and transforms into graphite. Further graphite transforms into diamonds with a diameter of about 0.4 inches. Now, before you start figuring out how to book a diamond-collecting field trip, know that these diamonds don't last. After they enter the planet's core, they melt. Ever notice how when you're stargazing two nights in a row in the same time, let's say 9 p.m., the stars stay in the same place, but the moon doesn't? Well, there are two reasons for that. First, it depends on what time you go stargazing. For instance, if you go outside at 8 p.m., and tomorrow you look for it at 11 p.m., you'll see the moon in two pretty different places. In this case, even the stars take different places in the sky since our planet is spinning. As you know, it takes 24 hours for it to make one full circle. That means, from our point of view, it seems like both the sky and everything up there is just moving around us one time per 24 hours. In the same way, the sun changes its position, rising and setting every day. So, if you went outside two nights in a row at the same hour, in most cases, you'll have to wait for an extra half hour or more until the moon gets back to the same position as the night before. The stars are pretty much standing still. It seems like they're moving, but that's because the Earth is spinning. But the moon is actually moving around our planet and goes through different phases. For example, a new moon is when it's completely dark in the sky. A full moon is when its day side is facing the Earth. It takes approximately a month for it to finish one circle around the Earth. Maybe you'd be luckier on a diamond-collecting expedition on this next planet. 
40 million light years away from Earth. Scientists used to call it a super Earth. Now, a super Earth is generally a planet way bigger than ours. This planet, for example, is double the Earth's size. It's so close to its star that it makes a full circle around it in less than 18 hours, which means a year there is pretty short. Since it's so close to its star, its temperature goes up a whopping 4,900 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of the heat, in combination with the planet's density, scientists have the theory that its core is made of carbon in the form of graphite and diamonds. Over 10 years ago, astronomers discovered a huge water vapor cloud. It was 12 billion light years from our home planet. That cloud is the biggest source of water we know of. It's also the oldest, dating back to when the universe was only 1.6 billion years old. Now it's 13.8 billion years old. Man, if only I had started a savings account 12 billion years ago. With compound interest, I'd have me quite a pile of cash by now. But I wasn't around then. Anyway, this cloud is so large it holds 140 trillion times the amount of water in all the oceans on our planet. This cloud kind of feeds a black hole. It may also contain enough gases, such as carbon monoxide, to encourage the black hole to grow six times bigger than it is at the moment. The average temperature of our planet is about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And the highest temperature ever measured was 134 degrees. Sound too hot? Well, on Venus, it can go up to 900 degrees, which makes it the hottest planet in our solar system. It's not hot enough to melt steel, though. It would need to be higher by 2,500 degrees to get there. But it's hot enough to melt lead. And it's way too hot to sustain life, at least not in any form that we know. Venus is not even the closest to the Sun, it's Mercury. But it has a super thick atmosphere that traps greenhouse gases. It's like you covering yourself with a pretty thick blanket in the middle of the summer. Now, we're used to seeing volcanoes spewing hot molten lava. After all, that's what they mostly do on Earth. But in space, volcanoes tend to spew methane, water, or ammonia. And these materials freeze as they erupt and eventually transform into frozen vapor and something called volcanic snow. I'm talking about cryovolcanoes here. You can find them on Jupiter's moons Io and Europa, Saturn's moon Titan, and Pluto. These volcanoes are especially active on Io, which has hundreds of vents. NASA vehicles have even captured some of these erupting in real time. Plumes of frozen vapor coming out of them extended for about 250 miles. Hey, by the way, they just discovered another moon around Jupiter that might actually be good for farming someday. It's named EIEIO. <laughs> Now, what exactly happens to the light after it disappears inside of a black hole? Well, photon is a particle of light. The event horizon is the boundary of a black hole. When something, say a photon, crosses the line and enters those boundaries, it can't escape anymore. But it doesn't mean a black hole destroyed it. It pulls the photon in rapidly towards its center, where an enormous mass is packed into an infinitely small space. But we're not sure what happens to photons in such extreme conditions. It's still one of the biggest mysteries. Does a black hole destroy the light or not? Saturn has 82 moons we know about, 53 confirmed and 29 more that are still on the waiting list to be confirmed as actual moons before they get their official names. And one of the coolest moons might be a 914-mile-wide hunk of rock called Aepetus. It's dark on one side and bright on the other. Its lighter half is 20 times more reflective than the other one. As it turned out, the bright side is ice. The dark side is a bit more complicated. One theory says it's dark because of particles coming from another moon, the one named Phoebe. Another theory says it could be because of heat. Since the moon is rotating really slowly, its dark material is absorbing heat, which makes it even darker. Now, how big do you think a black hole can become? In theory, we can't find an upper limit to its mass. But astronomers believe the ultra-massive black holes, or UMBHs, located in the cores of certain galaxies are mostly up to 10 billion solar masses big. Recently, they even discovered these UMBHs physically can't grow much more than this because, in that case, they would start to disrupt the accretion disks that feed them. That way, they would kind of stuff the source of new material. 
Most people picture the universe as somewhere between aquamarine and pale turquoise. Even some researchers thought that was the case. They managed to determine the cosmic color by combining light from more than 200,000 galaxies within 2 billion light years of our planet. But the real color is actually closer to beige. Researchers got it all wrong because there was a bug in the software. No, really? <laughs> it converted the cosmic spectrum into the color our eyes would see if we were exposed to it. The team defined this color as a cosmic latte. Ooh, make that a double-shot low-fat large to go, please. Venus has exceptionally high temperatures, hot enough to melt lead. It's the hottest planet in our solar system, with a high-pressure environment and super strong winds. The winds there are 50 times faster than the planet's rotation. It's getting stronger over time, and scientists don't know why. But they did find something interesting in the planet's clouds, a potential sign of decaying biological matter. Could there be life then? Not quite, since Venus has a dry, windy atmosphere and doesn't have enough water for life to develop. Rings around other planets are more common than we thought. Saturn's rings are the most famous and spectacular ones. They partially consist of reflective, sparkly water ice, and you can't see anything like that in the rest of our solar system. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune have ring systems too, and those most likely consist of dust and rocky particles. And not just planets, astronomers found out rings were around one asteroid as well. Speaking of rings, why do you think that Earth doesn't have them? Gas giants have rings, while the rocky ones don't. Two theories explain how rings form. They could be the remains from the times when planets were forming. Or they could be leftover material of an impact that destroyed an unknown moon. Or gravity broke apart this moon of its parent planet. It's not clear why only the gas planets have rings. They formed in the outer area of our solar system, while rocky planets only in its inner circles. May be a good clue. Maybe these inner rocky planets had just better protection from strong impacts that could have formed rings. Also, there are more moons in the outer solar system. And there are more rings there. Another thing may be that bigger planets have a bigger volume, so a ring system can remain stable there. Some theories even say that Earth used to have a ring system. A long, long time ago, our planet collided with a Mars-sized object, which most likely resulted in a dense ring of particles and debris. But our story was a bit different than the outer planets, and those rings probably combined and formed the Moon. Do we know the shape of the universe? Einstein had a theory of general relativity. It said that the universe could be in one of these three forms, closed like a sphere, open like a saddle, or flat like a piece of paper. Its shape determines whether it's infinite or not, and whether it will expand forever or maybe collapse at some point. The shape of the universe depends on its density and rate of expansion. One of the best ways to determine its shape is to use something called the cosmic microwave background. It's the relic afterglow, something that's left of the Big Bang. Sound waves that were moving through the universe in its early stages produced quite small spatial variations in the temperature of its faint light. The result of these studies show that the universe probably expands in all directions, which means it's flat. How come our sun is hot while the moon is cold? The sun gives off heat because its core is extremely hot. In there, the pressure is pretty high. The hydrogen turns into helium. That's how the sun creates light and heat. The solar light and heat are enough to light up our days on Earth, as well as support life here, even though the sun is around 93 million miles away from us. The moon is not hot because it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it can't absorb sunlight as our planet does. Its surface gets very hot in the daytime, about 210 degrees Fahrenheit. But since there's no atmosphere, the temperature drops extremely during the night to negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is hot, no doubt there, but the space around it is very cold. Heat is the energy objects store inside of it. Temperature is how we measure if something is hot or cold. So when you transfer heat to certain objects, its temperature goes up. Take it away, and the temperature goes down. 
you can transfer heat in three different ways. Convection, conduction, and radiation. Convection works within gases and liquids, and conduction is for solids. The temperature only affects matter. Space doesn't have enough particles. It's nearly a complete vacuum, which means transferring heat is not effective. The only way to do it is through radiation. When the heat coming from the sun falls on an object in the form of radiation, the atoms that make up that object will absorb energy. This energy moves the atoms and makes them produce heat throughout this process. In space, temperatures of the objects stay the same for a long time. Cold objects stay cold, and hot ones stay hot. If you place anything outside of the Earth's atmosphere and expose it to direct sunlight, the sun will heat it to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Objects in outer space that surround our planet and don't receive sunlight directly are at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature is like this because there are molecules that escape our atmosphere, so the sun heats them. We used to think that water was really rare in space, but now we know there's water ice across our entire solar system. For starters, you can usually find water on asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on Mercury and the Moon that are in permanent shadows. On Mars, you'd find ice at its poles, under the surface dust and in frost. It might not be enough to support human colonies up there, but it's still something. Some other bodies in our solar system also contain ice, like the dwarf planet Ceres and one of Saturn's moons. Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, could be one of the most likely candidates we know about that could contain life. It probably has an entire ocean under its frozen and cracked surface. It could have twice as much water as all oceans on our planet together. Titan, the biggest of Saturn's moons, also has a liquid cycle, but it's not water. Its cycle moves materials between the surface and the atmosphere. At first, it sounds like the water cycle we have on Earth. But immense lakes on Titan are filled with ethane and methane. There's a chance they're over a layer of water. Neptune is about 30 times as far from the Sun as we are. Of course, it gets significantly less light and heat than Earth. But it also radiates way more heat than it's generating. There are more things happening in its atmosphere especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Uranus is closer to the Sun, but it still radiates the same amount of heat as Neptune. The winds on Neptune are insanely strong, 1,500 miles per hour. No one still knows why. It could be a gravitational contraction, energy coming from its core, or the Sun. I hope we'll eventually find out. Can you imagine hot ice? It exists just 33 light years away from us, on one exoplanet. This planet consists of different water elements and they form burning ice. The ice there is solid because of pressure, but the surface temperatures are extreme and go up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how the water stays super hot and comes off as steam. Picture putting ice in your coffee when you want to heat it up. When you stargaze, it's almost like you're looking into the past. Stars are really far away, and it takes longer for their light to reach our planet. So it's possible some of them have already run out of fuel and aren't alive anymore. The pillars of creation are a good example. This is part of a region 7,000 light years away from us called the Eagle Nebula. These are clouds of gas and dust in the shape of pillars. Scientists first discovered it in 1995, but in reality, a supernova explosion destroyed these pillars that were at least 6,000 years ago. So, the 1995 image shows these pillars from 7,000 years ago. Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system that we know of so far. It's bigger than the whole state of Hawaii, and 100 times larger than the biggest volcano on Earth. The red planet seems so quiet, but once upon a time, large volcanoes dominated its surface. Volcanoes on the red planet can probably grow so big because gravity there is a lot weaker than down on Earth. Also, the crust on our planet is moving all the time, and the Martian crust probably stays still. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the